Hello, friends. I am so happy to have done the interview that you're going to listen to here on Mindful Mutiny. I just got finished interviewing Alex and Ashley Morris of The Wanderlusters. You can find them on virtually any social media that there is. The spirit of these two. They live in a converted Greyhound bus, and they raise their two children in this. They travel all over the United States because they decided that they were going to pretty much just walk away from a conventional life and live their lives in a minimalist way and live their lives putting experience and each other first. You're going to feel their just wonder and optimism and happiness and their life really isn't ex an expensive one to live. They told me after this interview that we did, their entire rig cost them $32,000. And so for all of the people out there that are thinking that a life that is different is something that is unattainable, well, you know what? It's really not. And you're going to really experience the the, the happiness and the sense of possibility that Ashley and Alex just exude. So please sit back and enjoy this installment of Mindful Mutiny. Welcome to the Mindful Mutiny Podcast. I am Jeremy Van Wert, CEO and transformational coach. I help professionals like you dedicate as much time to yourselves as you do to your work by forming a strategic plan for your life future, and goals. The Mindful Mutiny podcast is about people who thoughtfully rebel against the status quo by bravely pursuing their highest potential. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Mindful Mutiny podcast. That sort of thing really helps us grow a podcast like this. It makes all the difference in the world. Today, we have the very special guests. We have the Wanderlusters, Ashley and Alex Morris. Hey, how's it going? Hey. It's going <laughs> awesome. I can't wait to get into your story. Ashley and Alex Morris, known as the Wanderlusters, embraced a profound shift in their lives, breaking away from the monotony of routine and societal expectations. Disenfranchised by the daily grind, they prioritized meaningful experiences over material success. Opting for a simpler, slower-paced life, they traded the stress of mortgages for the freedom to explore diverse landscapes with their children in a converted Greyhound bus. The Wanderlusters' journey is a testament to choosing fulfillment based on personal values rather than conforming to societal norms, inspiring others to consider alternative paths and prioritize co uh, connection, experiences, and a life without regrets. I am so excited to have you. Welcome! That was Thank you. I, that I was like an amazing introduction. Yes. I couldn't have said it better myself. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really seems to be kind of like the 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 track that you that you weave with the things that you do. I came across you by seeing you on social media and these wonderful, fun little videos that you have, and I just had to talk to you. Yeah. 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 I'm so glad you reached out. Yeah. Same. So, so tell us a little bit about what it is that you do and, and how this all came about. Okay. So how it all came about is we were homeschooling our kids in our house before we ever even knew that people did this. And I was scrolling through Instagram, looking at other people's homeschooling setups and looking for more information about it. And I saw this family in a toy hauler. They were on the back deck and they were all spread out in a beautiful place just doing school. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a thing. It was like hashtagged road schooling. So I went to him and he was working a corporate nine to five job in automotive. And I was like, let's sell everything. Let's get an RV, let's travel the country. And he was like, yeah, we can't do that. I have to be here for my job. And then one day he went into work and completely without any warning whatsoever, they just laid him off. And I got another. So yeah. I was, uh, I was in automotive for 10 years and I was in new development. So I was a new launch engineer and I was working with customers and they were bringing in people and they were laying off people in the, in the company. 
risk. Yeah. So like I thought, I thought my job was safe, right? I was like, I'm the only person in my department. I'm the only person doing this stuff. Like no way they can lay me off. <laughs> and sure enough, I come into the conference room and it was right then and there. There was no two weeks, no nothing. They were like, this is it. You're done. And they laid off probably about 25, 30 employees, all with 10 plus years experience. And I feel like we just kind of took that as, as, as a sign. I was worried. Mm -hmm. I think she was worried at first too. Cause we we're like, what are we going to do? We had bought a house. We were doing all the traditional American life stuff. You know, yeah. we had some acreage, we were growing a family, we were doing all the things and then boom, rug pulled out from underneath you. Yeah. And so we spent a couple of days trying to look for a job. And I feel like she was just like, this now is our sign. Time. This, the, yep. we need to, this is our sign to get on the road. Yeah. And also, I feel like it was in that moment that we both kind of realized that at your job, you're just not worth as much to them as you are to your family at home. You're replaceable. They can drop you like nothing with no warning and replace you. And it's like, why do you put so much effort into something that truly at the end of the day isn't going to be the thing that matters the most to you? It was a big eye-opening moment for me at that point because it was I was focusing a lot of time for work and I was we were growing a family and my yeah. kids were growing up, they were walking, they were taking steps, they were doing all their firsts, and I was away for all those things. I was yeah. working 80 plus hours a week. And so like there, making that switch yeah. to be able to kind of be more family focused, because growing up my whole life, I was like, I know I'm gonna want two kids, I want a family, I want to do all this stuff, and I want to be a great dad for them. And I feel like I was just spending more time at work. I was investing all of that time and that crucial energy into something that wasn't giving me as much of a net mm -hmm. return, right? Versus investing all of that time and effort into my family and fostering a strong connection and fostering togetherness and things like that. So that was the big switch that we did in this whole mindset change. There were nights that he would sleep in his truck in the parking lot of work because it didn't make sense for him to make the drive home because he had to work so much. Yep. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm trying to put my head in the space where you were at Alex, because you put in a good 10 years, you feel like there's some mutual loyalty there. The corporation makes a couple of decisions and you're out on your head. And this, this, idea had been floated, you know, by you, Ashley, about we should do this thing. But I can't imagine that for you in that moment when you're getting laid off that you're like, oh, well, this works in just fine. We'll just go buy a bus and we'll be fine here. It was probably more of an anvil to the head. Yeah, it was it was definitely a lot because my my initial thought, I mean, I was I was 29 years old at the time. And my whole thought process was like, I need to go to work. I need to do this. I need to Join like climb the corporate ladder. I need to be able to make more, invest more, 401k, all of the things. And it just essentially got all swiped away from us. So it's like, what do we really do? So that was really kind of like a, a hard hit to the head of like, we need to think moving forward what our best options were. And she is a fantastic creative person that has she's got so many whimsical ideas of all this stuff she was like let's do this and in my mind i'm thinking the whole he time i'm like it was a pipe dream he's like that's a wonderful pipe dream but that's not a reality for us yeah i was like you have to you have to go to work you have to be able to make money like you have to physically go to a job and do all these things and i was like we're not loaded we're not we didn't win the no. lottery we're not mm -hmm. like we're not on it we don't have a trust fund and that stuff i was like we have to like work to be able to do all of these things and she laid it all out i mean i don't know how many months of research that she would do but she would come to me with slides like we can do this because of this nice. and all of this yeah so she would come to me with powerpoint presentations <laughs> of all of this stuff and it's not the first time. That's no. like that's that's her approach that she'll do. She'll be, if she's trying to convince me of something, she'll do a bunch of research and be like, "Look, I know the questions that you're going to ask. Mm -hmm. I already have them answered for you." Yeah. And that's exactly what she did for moving for getting our life onto the road. I, I'm just I'm just seeing like Ashley in a pantsuit with like a laser pointer going. This is us. This is our budget now. This is you walking onto a bus. This is. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and and right so now. you you I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I remember I was a full-time hairdresser. I was a cosmetologist in a salon. And I remember telling my boss while we were at work one day, I was like, I'll know that I have truly made it in life when I can live in an RV and travel with my my family. And she laughed at me. Here <laughs> and we the are. clients laughed at me and they thought I was joking. <laughs> but that, I, I, I think about that sometimes, saying that and then like looking back and being like, hey, you made that happen. She did. <laughs> she did. And, and, and for those who haven't really traveled in an RV, 
it's this experience where you look around yourself and you go, why do I need more than just this? It is everything that I need absolutely right here. And so you've been able to take your complicated lives with a house and a garage and all these things and a shed and a lawnmower and all these different things and put it all into a bus with the things that you need and be mobile. Yes. So when we when we originally started out, we I feel like we were very, very cautious about the approach. So yes. the very first rig that we moved into, I should say the very first rig we ever even went in. Yeah, we was, had never RV'd before we bought our RV and moved into it. Yep. And so we bought a travel trailer. We bought a 30 foot travel trailer and we pulled it into the driveway of our home. Mm -hmm. started remodeling the whole thing because we bought it. It was, it was pretty tore up, but it's we wanted bad to condition the thing yeah. that the main thing that we wanted to do for making the switch is to lower our overall bills. So we didn't want a payment. We didn't want any of that stuff. So we mm -hmm. bought a used travel trailer that we could fix up and take care of any damages and things like that. And then be able to go from there. Cause like, we didn't want to transfer like having a mortgage to then having a mobile mortgage. Right. So then um, we kept our house cause we owned our, our house and the big thing that we did, I told her and I was like, look, I gave her one big hurdle to jump over. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if you can find somebody to rent our house and the, the amount was about about 500 more per month than we were paying for our mortgage. I was like, if you can find somebody to rent our house out for this, then we can get on the road and we can do these things. Because it's not that we wanted to sell the house yet because we didn't know how this life was going to be. We had we never know. RV'd before. Yeah, we didn't know if we were <laughs> going to like it, if it was going to work out. And we wanted to be able to have a fallback, especially because we had two kids. We need to be able to have that reassurance that if something happened, we can kind of get back into the way of life that we have already been doing just in case something went wrong. And that was honestly part of my pitch to him. I was like, we can always go back. We could just try it out for a year. And we used his severance pay from being laid off to buy the travel trailer, to remodel it, and to help fund our travels for a bit. I did hair on the road because I was already a cosmetologist. I was already doing hair. And plus, we rented our house for a little bit more than what our mortgage was. So we had a profit every month from it. Yep. And so we did that for a year and it did not take long. This was all pre-COVID. Yeah. And all this happened. So this was before anything got crazy, anything like that. And we made our way down to Florida. I, I, I'm going to say within the first couple of weeks, I was like, we're going to make this work. You know, this is this is bringing us happiness. The kids yeah. are being together. You're going to campgrounds. You're meeting other people. You're you're seeing this very large community that up until that point, I didn't even realize existed. Yeah. You know, like you go to a campground, and you're like, hey, this is fun. But then you realize that that's all the time. There's always kids. They're all they're making new friends. They're learning new experiences. And at the same time, road schooling or being on the road, everybody's homeschooling. Everybody's got their different ways that all their kids are learning different things. And so you just kind of evolve with that. And it just it brings you fulfillment. I feel like for me, like this has really brought me a lot of fulfillment as a, as a dad and as a husband and as a friend. To be honest, we have a much more active social life now on the road than we ever did in our house. For example, we are in a big circle with a bunch of friends in the middle of the desert. Tonight is margarita night. We're doing karaoke. We're going to make pizza. All the kids are running around playing in the middle of this circle. Like, I think a lot of people don't realize how awesome the community is. It of, really is. Yeah, our beers. I've got some serious FOMO going on right now, you know, because whenever, because my wife and I, we, we've done a lot of RVing and what we learned really quickly is you pull into an RV park with a problem with your rig and you have every guy on five spaces this way and that way in your rig with wrenches, looking at it, trying to figure it out. And in no time it's fixed because people know what they're doing and they've been around and they've had to fix things on the fly. And there is such a, such a delight that people take in helping you get down the road. And so you, you had community where you lived, but it sounds like you have so much more community now that you're traveling. Yes. Yes, for sure. I mean, Absolutely. like, as, as we were speaking, I'm at a, I'm at a friend's rig helping him out with some solar stuff. So yep. like, I mean, I feel he like took a, he took a break to come do this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's just, it's a neighborhood of people helping people. If there's something yeah. you don't know, 
somebody around you will. And then at the same time, there's going to be somebody around you that might not know something that you do. And so it's just, a, it's a trade of information. It's a trade of mm -hmm. skill. It's a trade of help. And then that, that just fosters good friends, good connection, great community. And something that you know that even you're, even when you're far away from your home or your original state or your house or anything like that, you know that you feel safe wherever you're going to be because you have this large community of people that are willing to help and be there for you. You talked a little bit about at the beginning, this kind of, birth of an idea that of course became more vivid when you lost your position, Alex, but there are people around you. There's, there's friends, there's neighbors, there's family that at a certain point learned what you were thinking about doing and they had various thoughts about it. Was, was What was that like? Uh, I would say once, once somebody kind of gets on the road and gets I like to call it like like the grind, right? Like the the daily grind that everybody kind of runs through when you're living in in a house or an apartment or you're you're running your normal job. Everybody, it's I feel like it's always a competition, right? So it's always a like I'm trying to do better because so and so is doing this. You're keeping it's like, up with the Joneses, exactly. Yeah. And then when you get out here, that mindset almost goes away. It's gone. It's in the Nobody it's in the sense about that. It doesn't matter what kind of rig you have. It doesn't matter how the value that you have behind anything, the mm -hmm. from a monetary anything like that. It's just all about enjoying life enjoying the connection and really making the most out of it because mm -hmm. at the end of the day the negativity or anything like that that comes with like people's mindset it's just not needed it doesn't do you any benefit it doesn't it doesn't make you feel any happier it doesn't bolster any skills or anything like that so we just try and cut that out and at the same time you see that around everybody else that's around you somebody's on the road doesn't matter what happens they're probably happy you know like yeah. we we run into issues the yeah. bus will break something will happen and then you look up at the sky and you're like the sun is shining yeah. i have friends here my kids are happy i'm happy mm -hmm. So you started the Wanderlusters as a website and social media and everything like that. How fast was it until you started getting a following? Um, We have had our Instagram since we launched. If you scroll way back, we have a picture of our family in front of our travel trailer. We have pictures from us in Florida that year and everything. So we started right away and actually it was my personal instagram before i switched it over to our family travel instagram and i feel like before people started following i i think a lot of people started following probably like two years ago would you say? I, I would say we got our big our, our big push when we moved into the bus yeah and so a lot. We like we like yeah. to say that like we're kind of interesting. People really like the bus. Yeah. People really like <laughs> you know like the I'll call it like the odd way of being able to do things. You know you don't think you don't look at a bus driving down the road and you're like I'd like to live in that. You know a giant Greyhound but, bus. <laughs> I mean we do we love it. I see a bus yeah. on the road. I'm like that'd be a nice bus. Yeah. I'd like <laughs> to live in that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, it, and and the bus is very different than the travel trailer. It's much more insulated. It's you're higher. You're uh, it feels safer. Yes, it, it does. absolutely. That was that was a big selling point. So when yeah. we were switching from, we had the travel trailer for about two years, and we wanted to find something new, something bigger, something something to kind of like adjust. Like we had been in that for two years. We found other things that we liked. We found other things that we didn't like, and we wanted to switch something up. And I wanted. She wanted a fifth wheel at the time, and yeah. I wanted a motorhome of a sort. And like I, I should say, motorhome. I wanted something to drive. Yeah. I liked like that movie RV with Robin Williams. I tell people this all the time. Like it's it maybe doesn't showcase the Does best qualities it. of motorhome living, <laughs> but for me, I was like, I like that. I want to drive down the road. I want to look at cool things. I want my whole family to see. Like if we see something cool, we pull off to the side, we check it out, mm -hmm. we really experience it, and then we can just pop back on the road and keep going. And then she was like, Well, motorhomes are not very safe. No. They're not in the sense that like if an accident were to happen or anything like that, like they they essentially crumble. They're mm -hmm. they're they're fantastic vehicles, right? They they drive great, they're beautiful on the inside, slides, all that stuff. But if something were to happen, mm -hmm. we hit something, we roll over, something along those lines happen, a motorhome will essentially just crumble. Whereas we have a big Greyhound bus that is definitely safety tested. And yeah. like she showed me videos of them taking almost our exact bus in a crane and dropping it on its side. It was side. another presentation. Yes. Of it why was a we're not getting a motorhome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're getting a bus instead. <laughs> yep. And so that's what I saw. She was like, this is a motorhome accident and it's debris in a whole field. And she was like, and this is a bus accident. And the bus is sitting perfectly fine, not messed up at all. I was like, perfect. Sold me. Let's do that. <laughs>
That's amazing. That and 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 so, gosh, I want to get into the bus thing, but I want to get into the the um, pandemic thing. So you're on the road for about a year, and then the the whole world begins to change. And what was this like? Was there anxiety about it? What was it like for you? So it actually wasn't a whole year before that happened. It was only a few months. We had just left Michigan to go to Florida. We had so much wonder and amazement in our eyes for Florida and all the great things we were going to do. And then all of a sudden, everything just shut down and we didn't know what we were going to do. We we talked between us. We were like, do we just hightail it back to Michigan? What do we do? And he ended up talking to the people at the campground that we were at. And they were like, you know what? We'd rather you didn't leave. Um, you can stay here until the lockdown is over. And um, uh, shoot, I got I'm blanking. So, okay. <laughs> so learning that we, are, we are in a thousand trails. And a, yeah. and a thousand trails is a fantastic resource to use in the sense that they have campgrounds all over. And we were first getting on the road. And that was a big push. They were like, Utilize Thousand Trails. It's a lot mm -hmm. cheaper to be able to get into. There's a lot of families that are doing this stuff. And so we get down into Florida and we're at this campground. And we're where our original like pass was only we were only gonna be able to be there for two weeks. Well, like that mm -hmm. so happened to be like we pulled in like March of 2020 mm -hmm. when we pulled into this campground and stuff started to get started started getting wild, right? People are like talking about um going to the grocery store, everybody's wearing their custom like Masks spraying and down everybody. their groceries yeah it's all it's it's a whole wild world that's out there yeah and we were getting ready to leave and the whole thousand trail system we had reservations at another place and they were like we're not taking even if you have a reservation you're not allowed to come in we're pretty much shutting this whole down until we can kind of figure out the, everything that's going on and so i go up to the front i was like hey i was like is there something that we can do i was like i'm hearing that you're not going to be able to go to another one I was like, hey, are we able to extend? I was like, is it going to cost us anything? And they were like, we would actually recommend that you stay because it's easier for us. And once you're already in, everything is okay. But they kind of like separated the campground in the sense they're like, we don't want anybody gathering. They started, they like, they shut down the pool. They mm -hmm. shut down like the laundry room and things like that. And so like everybody is trying to figure out what we can do. The, the biggest thing for us at that point is that once everybody was locked down for so long, Nobody we, was allowed to leave or go anywhere. Well, we could go to the grocery store, but that was it. Yep. But we built this like community. So like we weren't hanging out with people, but like you would kind of walk by, you would see the same person. It was just like you would yeah. be at a regular neighborhood and everybody kind of lined up. So we were in Wachula, Florida. So I don't know if anybody knows what Wachula, Florida is, but it's it's <laughs> the in middle the, of nowhere. Yep. It's like uh, and it's right along this uh, this river. It's called Peace River. We pulled up our rig and somehow we ended up securing, I feel like, the best site in the entire campground. Yes. We backed right up to the water. We set up our hammocks. We set up our mat. The kids would go out to like to the river. You could kind of you could see some some crocs like floating or alligators. I don't know which one they would be. I don't know if it's <laughs> crocs alligators. or alligators. Yeah. alligators. OK, <laughs> that one. I think crocodiles are salt water. Maybe. Correct me if I'm wrong, but oh, yeah. I, I think they are. So we were just expert. there. <laughs> me either. And all the families were also like just chilling on the river. And so after about a month, when we kind of all just gathered a bit of like what was really going on, how this virus was really interacting with people and like what it is, we started to hang out a bit more and everybody was just a bit more welcoming. Well, they and also, it came out that it was okay to hang out outdoors. Yeah. 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 And so we were like, okay we live our life outdoors, you know? Yeah. So we'll go and we'll hang out. And we met, our kids met so many friends, friends that our kids have like best friends to this day. Yeah. were met in that campground during yeah. lockdown. So I feel like a lot of people had some rough times during the, the lockdowns. So they, they had a lot of rough times as far as like family and things that were happening. And, you know, like that was, that was definitely not a good thing, but I feel like for us, like we enjoyed it. We, we had a great time. We stayed in, it was 70 degrees all the time. We were Being hanging out from with friends. Michigan. We just appreciated the weather. <laughs> yeah. So we were just happy to be outside. And then so the one one thing that happened is when they shut down the pool, we were like, man, it's like 80 degrees outside. What are we gonna do? It's hot. So we we rigged up a truck bed uh pool. And so we put a tarp tarp in the back of our we we were we had a, a silverado and we put tarp in it and we just filled it up with water and we just we would just chill in our own private pool right at the the campsite. Yeah. And then our neighbors were like, that's a great idea. So they backed their truck up and they did the same thing. And so like we were enjoying the pool, but also distancing ourselves between them at the same time. So it was like a win-win. Everybody's staying cool. Everybody's having a good time. It was it was definitely a wonderful experience. I, I feel remember like I did our laundry 
in the bathtub. Like, I filled the bathtub with water and soap and, like, washed our laundry in our bathtub because I, we didn't have a washer and the laundry room was closed down. It was the only way we could. Yep. It, it, it was 1873. And you're back there with the washboard. Yep, yes. she was. She's, yes. she's spinning it. She's yes. got all the soap and suds and squeezing all the shirts and doing all the stuff. Like, yeah, it worked out. That's, that's brilliant. And and you notice the arm strength, right? Your arm strength. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> that's so great. That's and oh, and so like it honestly sounds like pandemic was a time of inventiveness. It was a time of seeking joy and finding it and of inventing ways to pass the time in community that, that you know that that met everybody's needs yes yeah yes and so you know your you, when did you get the bus and how did you select which one that you purchased i'm glad you asked jeremy so we, uh, I joined a few after I convinced him of the bus conversion. I joined a few bus conversion groups on Facebook, and I don't know how it came to be, but I had convinced myself that I want an MCI, and that is the only kind of bus that I wanted. So there's actually an MCI bus conversions for sale group on Facebook. And I was scrolling it, and I was expecting to find a bus that needed to be fully built out. But when I found this one, it was the exact floor plan that I had envisioned in my head. It was exactly what I wanted. And we have a full-size residential bathtub. That was a huge selling point for her. She was like, I'm going to have a bathtub in there. Yeah. This is ours. Yeah. And so I immediately went running to him with my phone, and I was like, I'm going to message him right now it was like 11 30 p.m and we were in utah so it was mountain time the bus was in new jersey and the seller actually responded right then saying that we could do a video facetime tour of it the next day yeah absolutely so so you're you're sitting in the bus right now behind you you have the kitchen yeah. and this was something that had already been worked on. There, there, there had been a lot of love put into this thing. It had been uh, renovated in, in, in by somebody who really knew what they were doing, and it was pretty well turnkey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the way that you see it right now is not how it looked when we bought it. We did do some things like the shelf up there, we put that in and we repainted everything. It was actually like a light gray, bluish color when we first got it. Yep. And so what ended up happening is that the the guy that sold it to us, they had a company build this whole thing. And so when they had it built, the the way I, I compare it to is they essentially made an apartment on wheels. Yeah. So like what we have here is we have a 240 volt stove that would be in an apartment. So the same, like the slightly slimmer version, which is great. Like that's a fantastic stove. But when you're on the move and all of those things and you're not hooked up to 50 amp at all times, we can't use it. So like currently it's storage, the stove is oh, can't see. stove just holds storage. Yeah. So we don't use it. We did, we did recently use it um, for the holidays for cooking up a lot of food. But other than that, I mean, we've been in the bus for two and a half years. Yeah. And I think we've used this, this stove twice. Yeah. So the reason why is like everything that was built in here, when you think of like a traditional RV or a travel trailer or anything like that, um, the lights, uh, the water pump, lots of things that'll work. They'll work on battery. They'll, they'll work without having to have an AC connection. When we bought the bus, everything would need an AC connection to run. We no couldn't matter even what flush happened. our toilet yeah, without being plugged in. You couldn't turn on a light. You couldn't do any of those things. So it was like, well, we have to make a switch there. So our very first thing that we did is we installed solar on the rig. So we put solar and we built it in the sense that it's going to have to run all the time. So we we splurged for the Victron components because I was like, this is going to be our life. I want to make sure that it's going to work sun up, sun down, no mm -hmm. problems. We're not going to have an issue. And that's what we did. And so we we did all that um, initially, and it's been working out great for us since. Amazing. Amazing. And and I'd like to ask you about your two children and the the sense of enrichment and the perspective that they are getting in the world because there was there was a period of time where you were living in a place and now you're watching them grow having these experiences 
and you know what has been the what has been the experience of watching them grow and who they're becoming I love that. I love the who they're becoming because it, they truly are like becoming little adults and they're they're growing. And before our house, we were in the middle of nowhere in like rural Michigan, surrounded by fields. They didn't have neighborhood kids that they could play with. Um, our neighbors were all older. They, and so they, they couldn't jump on their bike and ride it anywhere. They couldn't no. do any of those. Like we had a driveway and so you could go up and down the driveway. But then we also lived on a very busy road in the yeah. sense that everybody's doing 55 plus. And for us as a parent, you're like, I don't want my kid to go anywhere near a road where they're pushing 60 because yeah. like just in case. So like there was a lot of things. We had a lot of yard space. We had a lot of stuff, but it was like we would do that in the, in the confines of our home and not necessarily with the community. And I feel yeah. like that's a big thing is the social interaction that they have with other kids, mm -hmm. with other families, and just kind of being out and really developing developing themselves as a person, understanding what like the social norms, the things that you need to to do to like learn to understand, to interact with others, to learn how to treat people nicely, learn how to communicate with people and all those things. And oh. that's been huge. Not only that, but I feel like they have friends from all over the country in all different areas and with all different backgrounds. And I feel like that is something that you just can't get in a little small town staying there your whole life. Like he went to the same school system that I graduated from. And and I feel like the fact that now he gets to get or our son, he's the oldest. He's the one that like remembers being in a house. Our daughter was only like two when we hit the road. So I don't think she really remembers it so much. I think this is all she's ever known. Yeah. But as far as my son goes and all the friends that he he's made, I think it's just amazing that he has friends from everywhere and everyone has a different story and a different background. And there's something to learn from everybody. Exactly. And, you know, conversely, your own personal development, you it's it sounds like you grew up in a place and you'd stayed there and started a family and had a local job and everything like that. And now the two of you have been everywhere and, and meeting all of these different people. What has it been like for each of you in your own personal development? I got a, I got a good answer for that one, but if you okay, want to go first. Go ahead. Okay, so for me, it's been really eye-opening in the sense that originally from Michigan, lived there essentially my whole life, moved out when I was 29, I moved out of Michigan when we were 29, got on the road and all that stuff. And I feel like there's a lot to be missed if you don't just venture outside of your comfort circle. So I, I would consider the, the town that I grew up in and all of those things was a relatively small area, radius of maybe 30 miles. I spent essentially my entire life growing up, made all my friends, did all those same things. You kind of develop similar personalities with everybody. So as people kind of hang out, there's like the hive mindset in the sense that everybody has like similar views and things like that. I liked getting out and really seeing what is available out there in the sense that I, I'm a very open person. I love to communicate with people. I like to see how people live their life. Mm -hmm. I like to see what brings people joy and all those things. And getting out and really seeing what's out there has been truly eye-opening because I like to use, utilize that as like, how do I become a better person? How do I, how do I become a happier person, a more self-fulfilling person and things like that? And moving around has really done wonders for that. That's why with our social media, the biggest thing that I try and like communicate anything with is try living on the road or doing the travel life in some sense for a certain amount of time just to really get yourself outside of your your traditional comfort zone because there's thousands millions of people out there that you're going to be able to connect with that you're going to be able to communicate with that you're going to become best friends with that you're going to become all of these things and it's it's wild once you leave your your small circle your small area what really is out there and what you can learn and what you can really do. I don't feel like if you were to ask me five years ago, if I was ever to work on a, a diesel engine, install solar, do any of the things that I can do now, I would have told you no, because I, I had no idea. And then you kind of get out there and you learn from others. You learn other people's experience. You learn other people's stories. And you're like, man, if they can do it, like I can do it. And then you get the motivational support from them at the same time. They're like, hey, you're doing great. You got this. It's just that very uplifting, very... I don't know. I don't know what you want to call it. Just happiness. That's, that's the best word I can call it. Yeah. Fantastic. And what about you, Ashley? So basically everything he said, but I'll allow 
elaborate in the sense that I feel like getting out of your hometown really changes your perspective on what things were. I think it, and to elaborate even more on that, I feel like when when you're stuck in the same area with the same people doing the same things, you kind of get this mindset that that's how everything is everywhere. And you hear stories about other places, but you don't know if that's actually the truth unless you go there and you live there and you experience what the people who live there experience. And I just feel like getting out of my hometown shifted my perspective in such a way that it, it's just insane how much it has changed me like in the way that uh, I don't even know how, I don't even know how I, to like articulate it like I got a, I got a good way to do it so for for me in the sense of like there's always like a rough idea of what say we'll say from the United States like what other states are doing like the mindset that they're gonna have like the thought process that that state is having and then you go to that state and you actually yeah. interact with the people there yeah. and you realize that sometimes there's just, it's a bunch of nonsense that people are saying. It's a bunch yeah. of nonsense because they're just, they're just kind of talking to talk or they're talking it up. They're making it more drama than it actually is. And I'll say it in the sense from, you know, you're in California before we had ever went to California. I was like, man, I was like, I don't know how it's going to be. Right. I've heard all these stories. And then we go there and one, it's an absolutely beautiful, stunning state. You get yeah. there and every drive that you're going to have is absolutely stunning. And then you start walking around and you start talking with people. Yeah. You realize that people are still extremely nice. Everybody there is still just as helping. Like, it's not like a, it's like not a me versus you. I yeah. feel like that's a big thing to kind of get rid of. It's not a, the world is not a, I'm out to get everybody or everybody's out to get me. Everybody is here for togetherness, for community. Most finding people are good. People. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a big thing to find is yeah. that you find out that like the world is not evil. You know, most people are extremely nice. Most people are extremely helpful. Right. And it's just really opened our eyes traveling and meeting lots of people in that way. So I'm going to ask a kind of a double pronged question here, and it's about your sense of freedom. I would imagine that going and doing what you're doing, it has... You know, we, we there's there's this discussion in psychology about the opening up of new neural pathways, where your your mind just gets opened up. You can change the way you think. You can change the way that you feel about things. You can change the way that you view the world through expanding experiences that really honestly change the way your brain is actually made up to think. And so when we're talking about meaning in life and and what real freedom actually is. I, I imagine that the past four years have irreparably changed the way that you view everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I feel like as far as like my view of freedom, my view of freedom is not being weighed down by other people's expectations of who you should be and how your life should look. And living life for your family and those relationships and the memories that you create together and the things that are most important to you and not necessarily material things or, like I said, being weighed down by other people's expectations. Yeah. I would say my, my version of freedom is the comfort level of knowing, of being able to go somewhere or being able to do something and feeling confident in that. And so bus life and travel life has really put a lot of that in, into perspective because for me, it was when we were in our home, like, this is my safe space. This is my, I feel comfortable here. Mm -hmm. Like I'm okay here. And it was really trying to broaden that and make it elsewhere. And then I realized the more that we learn, the more that we evolve, the, the more skill sets that we acquire, life is just really rather easy even even on the road it's just the the skill is like, say that i mean like it, it would be in the sense We've that had some rough times <laughs> yeah, but i feel like those rough times lead to great skills and like even when we've had our darkest times we look back on them and we realize that those dark times happen and we've become the better greater people good. yeah out of for it. sure yes what is an example of a dark time, something that has been a real challenge to you that has posed a, a real obstacle? So my my very first, I don't know, I want to say very first, the toughest time that I had, we were driving, we were driving the bus and we were going from Washington and we were heading to, funny enough, down to where we are now. And we were on a very long road trip. We had just gotten, we'd spent the night at the casino. Um, we like to keep our travel days relatively short. 
So we packed everything up. It was a great travel day that we had. Yeah. Right. We go to sleep. We wake up. Everything's great. We start driving the bus. The first hour, two hours or so, everything is fine. We're like, man, this is great. We're coming down a grade. And what happens is, is it feels like a semi truck or something just rammed into the back of the bus. It felt like a rear ran a huge collision, but there's nothing. There was no, nothing around. And the stop engine light comes on, everything comes in, and we're coming down this mountain. And luckily, there's an exit off to the side. And so as we come down, we just roll the bus off to this exit. And there's a little, like, gravel, dirt parking spot off to the side that we're able to fit the bus into. And it just rolls into place. And so we get out because I was like, I don't, I don't know what happened. Maybe we lost a bunch of coolant. Maybe we lost and something, something happened on the engine. And we go back there. And she caught this on video, which at the time I didn't want. I was like, I'm upset. I was like, I don't know what's happening, you know, but like it, it really like was a crowning moment. We go back there and I open up the bay and on the side of the engine, I can just see smoke pouring out. And I can see on the side of the engine, there's a hole about this big in the block that the rod blew through. It blew the starter off of the engine. And I turn and look at Ashley and I was like, well, that's it. We're done. I was like, this isn't fixable. This isn't, this is not something that like, it's not going to buff out. Yeah. Like I can't, we can't sit here and have me work on this and then we can leave. I was like, right. this is it. This is catastrophic. We are done for. And it was a very defeating moment. Right. Cause for me it was, I didn't know what I could do to fix it. And like, yeah, you can throw money at stuff to fix it. But again, we're we didn't very, really have a lot of money. Yeah. We're like, again, we didn't win the lottery. We didn't do any yeah. of these things. We very, we live very frugally. We, we try and live well within our means to make sure that we don't have to like, really stress or work or like live paycheck to paycheck or do any of those things. And I was like, this is going to be huge. I hear everybody talking, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of being able to do something like this. And I was like, I don't know what we're going to do. And I feel like that whole point, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she and her ultimate positivity, because I feel like whatever brings me down, we're a good yin, yin and yang. Because if I'm really down, she's like this beacon of positivity i was like the bus is broke it can't move and she was like it's a beautiful spot the sun is shining and, and like that that really gets us through it so i feel like yeah. as a couple that's a very strong moment because she is definitely my anchor when it comes to that well not only that but i i said to him i remember i was like think about how this happened like we can't move our bus at all but we have managed to coast to this random exit and all it is is beautiful landscape all around us there's nothing else there and it's just this driveway that leads to what essentially looks like any other boondocking spot we've ever been to so it's not like anybody needed us to move we're not on the side of the freeway stuck we're in this spot where we have this time to figure out what what's next and i looked it up it was blm land like we were fine there and what are the odds that something horrifically catastrophic like that happens in the best way possible to where we were given that we spent the night there and just i was like let's just relax i was like we're fine we're gonna figure this out and i feel like this couldn't have happened in a better way and i still feel that way yeah because we had just went through probably 15 20 miles of an area where there was no exits it was like there's no there's mm -hmm. nothing around we're going upgrade downgrade upgrade downgrade you know mountains just kind of just in the middle of nowhere and this, this happens like the most catastrophic thing to the, the engine that can happen happens as we were like coming to the exit so like yeah if there if if any part of it is going to be divine that we are that like they're look that that he's looking out for us. It's that and it happened right there. We were able to coast off of the side. We were able to keep the family safe, and that was a big thing. Sometimes struggles happen. Sometimes things it's like things will break. But knowing that Ashley and the kids are going to be safe, it it, yeah. it makes me feel a lot better. It makes me know that like, hey, this happened, but we're still all okay. Nobody got hurt. There was no nope. fire. Exactly. Like we still had our home. Yep. And also something to add is prior to this, he had had zero mechanical experience whatsoever. I can change the oil and I can change brake pads. That's what I, that's, that was okay. my level of expertise before this. Yes. And so even then, like he was like, I, we need a mechanic. I don't know what to do here. I don't and, even know where to start. Yeah. You know? And now after that, I don't know if you want to talk about that whole process with the mechanic. Yeah. I would love to, I would love to tell this story because. So, yeah. um, we called around, she listed about 15 places. She was like, let's check all these. So 
we take a bike, ride the bike up to the top of the mountain nearby so we can have cell service. Because we were at, we had no cell was, service. There was nothing we had, around. We had internet because we had Starlink. So we were able to do all of those things, but we didn't have cell service to call anybody. So she looked up a bunch of numbers. I went up to the top of this hill and I called and everybody was like months out. You know what I mean? Like, I can't, I can't even look at you for a month. You know, we're booked out for six months. And I called this guy and his name was John. It was, it's uh, John's Auto and Diesel. And this guy is absolutely amazing. I call him up. And I was like, hey, man, I was like, I got a, I got a Detroit Diesel Series 60. I was like, the it blew up. The rod came through the side of the engine. I got a big old hole in the engine. I was like, I'm looking for some help as far as like switching all this stuff out and things like that. And he was like, oh, yeah. He was like, I'm a Detroit Diesel master uh, mechanic. He was like, I've been working on them for 20 plus years. He was like, we'll come um, bring it on by. We'll take a look at it. And I was like, I got one more curveball to throw at you. <laughs> I was like. Uh, I was like, me and my wife and my family, I was like, we travel in the bus. I was like, we live in it full time. I was like, are you cool? Are we able to bring the bus by and still like live in it? You know, because I was like, I didn't want to have to go and like do hotel rooms and do all this we stuff. We couldn't afford that. Yeah. And it was he, just not realistic for us. Yep. And he didn't even take a minute. He was like, he was like, yeah, man, for sure. He was like, pull the bus up. He was like, we'll hook you up with power. We'll hook you up with water, whatever else you need. He was like, I got this bay door right here. He was like, call this tow company. They know me. They work with me. He was like, they'll back you right up. And sure enough call them up. They're like, yeah, we'll hook you up. They told us it was about, about nine, 10 miles away, backed us up right to the garage. The guy was out there waiting. We introduced ourselves. We took a look at it and he's just, he was giving me a bunch of information. And so we took that time frame to really look around to try and find an engine, to, to, to find what was going to work for us that was going to work well in our budget and all of these things. And this guy was, John was such a nice guy. He was like, I'm going to teach you all your, all of these things. I was like, I was like, I really like to learn and understand what's happening. He was like, you can be there with me the whole time. And so I thought like, okay, he's going to do a lot. I'm going to kind of be there. I'm going to be over his shoulder. I'm going to be the flashlight guy. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to see what he's got going on. Yeah. And he starts showing me all this stuff. And he, I was like, Hey, do you mind if I start taking it apart? He was like, yeah, he was like, that would be great. So I ended up, I would, I would ask him questions as far as like, what do I need to do? What is this for? What is this component? How am I going to take this off? And he would talk me through it and then I would get to do it. Yeah. So we pulled the bus into the shop. We still were living in it. Yeah. Right? We were there for, we were there at the shop for about three months. And when the shop would close down, I could go out there and I could work on all the stuff. So he was like, you have access to all my tools. You can utilize whatever you need to, to work on this thing. And I mean, I had lifts, I had every tool that imaginable tools that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> he, he had, and I was able to use, and I was able to change out that engine. I want to say I did a large portion of the work. Which is why, which is why it took as almost, long as it did. I would say you did almost all of it, besides physically moving the in engine in and out because that's a couple guy job. He did everything else. The mechanic would tell him at the beginning of the day, "All right, this is what you have to do today. This is how you do it," and then just leave him to it. And he could ask questions and ask for help if he wanted to. But you don't give yourself enough credit. You did that whole thing pretty much yourself. Thanks. Yeah. I feel it was it was definitely a lot of work. I know, and that like the the. It was a very tough time at that point when it all happened. But looking back on it now, I feel a lot more comfortable. If something happens in the engine or there's some sort of troubleshooting, I'm like, I feel confident and I know exactly what's going on with this engine, where all the components are, what might potentially go wrong, what I should look for. And that level of, I'm going to say confidence that he gave me is absolutely through the roof. He was the nicest guy. I shout him out all the time. I, I refer really him. really changed our lives. Exactly. I've made lifelong friends with yeah. him. We stopped by we last year. We went back to visit, just to visit and hang out with him. Yep. Pulled yeah. the bus up to the shop and I was, they, they all saw the bus. They're like, oh no, what happened? I was like, no, no, no. I was like, we're not here for work. I was like, the bus is running great. I was like, yeah. we're just here to hang out this time. Yeah. <laughs> what an amazing story. And, and he, it be, turned out to be a blessing in disguise. You learn so much about it and the usable knowledge of that, giving you so much more ability to know your rig with, with yes. something like that. Then I, I would just imagine the sense of helplessness that you have. You just see what happened. You go, what are we going to do? Yep. Mm -hmm. And he was so calm and collective with everything. I was like, because I'm looking at this stuff and we're on a bus. They're big components. Stuff is heavy. Bolts are like rusted on they're real hard and he was, he's giving me every tip and trick in the book to be able to take care of it and it's just like 
that level of confidence that he instilled in me, I was like, this, this guy is a fantastic guy. I refer him all the time. He is such an amazing guy. I call him like we called him up I, I, um, just recently. I had no idea what biodiesel um, <laughs> was or in the sense that like, I know that like some rigs can run it, but I was like, I don't exactly know. And I called him up and I was like, Hey, we're pulled up. I need fuel. All they got is biodiesel. I was like, how does this work? And he was like, are you going to stay in warmer cold weather, colder weather? He was like, if you're going to be in warm weather, run it all the time. He was like, if you're going to be in cold, he was like, just don't do it. He <laughs> was like, it'll change. And just knowing that, that like, I can call him up and he's, he's happy to hear me. I'm happy to hear him. It's, it's been an amazing connection that we have developed with him. Unbelievable. And I, and I would, uh, what an incredible adventure. And, and that, that was based out of something that happened. That was a negative thing. The, the rig, you know, a breaking down. I imagine that there's other things that have happened where you just meet somebody who introduces you to somebody who introduces you to something all, all of a sudden you're in a completely different place, having an experience that you never expected to have. Does, does that sort of thing happen a lot? Well, honestly, after we left the mechanic shop, do you want to talk about that that oh. happened? Like what he took that knowledge that he learned from there and used it. And I'm still amazed at this man. I'm I'm not even just saying that. Like I'm blushing. <laughs> just the things that he has been through and accomplished and overcame. And it's just so admirable. So anyway, go we, ahead. <laughs> we, replaced, we replaced the engine. We had to get down to where we are now, which is in Quartzsite, Arizona. We had to quickly get down here. And so we left at like midnight out of the shop because we were pushing the very last minute to get down here. And so we drove all the way through the night. We get all the way down here. The bus is driving awesome. No problems. Everything is great. We get down here. We come to the Quartzsite RV show. We meet some friends. We talk around with people. We come back to the bus and I was like, all right, I need to go dump tanks. So we have to go and empty our gray tank, empty our black tank, because we just did a bunch of traveling. And I was like, all right, I'm going to start the bus up. I fire the bus up. And the tanks, the, the the dump station is about two miles down the road. So I jump in the bus. Ashley and the kids are hanging out with our friends. I was like, you guys can stay outside. I'll go take care of all this. I drive the bus down. I'm waiting in line, right? I finally pull up to the pump station. I got the bus on. And I pull everything out. We're dumping. And all of a sudden, I hear, like, a loud collision. And I was like... What is that? It sounded like, because we have a gigantic belt that drives our air cooler and radiator fan, it sounded like that belt broke and then was just like flapping around in the back of the engine bay. And so I quickly run in the bus and I turn it off and I, I go to the rear expecting to see this belt broken up, maybe a couple other components, maybe a blasted a pipe, maybe something like that. And I open it up and everything's fine. Everything's perfect. I was like, that's weird. So we're on our bus. We're able to start it from the rear. There's a there's a control board in the back to be able to start and stop the bus. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go up front. I'm going to flip the key. I'm going to go back. I'll start it here just to kind of see what's happening. And I go and flip and I, and I try and turn it. And the, the fan and the crank don't spin. But I can hear the starter engage. And you can hear it like whirring, like just like kind of almost like a grind. And the only reason why I knew what to look for here is because I literally just had it apart two days ago it was it was separated two days ago and we we there's a, a flex plate in between there and i was like i think something like this happened so i call up john and, and the, I, the separate to, like for context is the transmission and the engine the flex plate connects the transmission and the engine yep okay and so <laughs> i call up john i was like hey i was like it, I'm trying to start it. He listens. He was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, I think what's happening is that the starter's turning the flywheel on the transmission, and it's not actually cranking the engine. He was like, yeah, it sounds like that 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 might be it. So I call up our friends, and they have a one-ton dually truck. And I was like, hey, the bus broke. Can you please come tow us? And so we're only a few miles away from where our spot is. And sure enough, we hook up the tow strap. The air is released out of the for the, the bus. And I was like, we only have a few minutes because the air is going to leak. And once all the air is out of the system in like the bus or semi trucks and things like that, once you have no air, the brakes will set because it's kind of like a safety feature. Right. So if you have no air being supplied, if an airline breaks, then once that goes, it's going to lock all the wheels. And so I was like, I told him that was, it was our friend, Nate. I was like, hey, I was like, we only have a few minutes to be able to get here because without the engine running, I don't have a compressor to be able to keep the airlines or to be able to keep air in the brakes for us to go. And so sure enough, he starts towing me and we get, we, we're getting ready to cross a busy road. And I was like, all right, I'm on the phone with them. I was like, take it kind of slow, make sure traffic is clear. And I was like, traffic's clear, we can cross. And so there was a slight pause in it where the, the, the rope kind of got a little bit loose. And then he, he went, he, he uh, accelerated it tight line and it snapped. Right. And so now the bus is sticking probably about two feet out into this road where the road is 60 miles an hour. And I have no way to move the bus. The tow rope just broke. 
I was like, oh no, I ran outside. I grabbed the tow rope. I do like this quick double knot on it as he backs up. And I was like, we got to go, we got to go. Cause there's cars stopping everywhere. Everybody was, everybody stopped. They all saw the big, the big black bus just chilling in the middle of the road. They're like, something's happening. We better slow down. <laughs> and so he gets going and we tow ourselves all the way back to our spot. And we ended up fixing the bus in the middle of the desert. It took again, probably about another two, three months to do. And for that, it was very much like, I was on my own in the sense that like, I didn't have John, I didn't have his shop. I didn't have his tools. I have his lifts. I didn't have any of the things that I was able to utilize. And I was like, I don't know how we're going to make this work. And so sure enough, I start, I was like, I tell Ashley, and I tell our friends, I was like, it's an easy fix. I got to remove like eight bolts. I can pull out this, fl this, this flex plate. I'll take that. We'll change it out. And we'll bury it back together. It'll all be done. No. And it sounds great on paper. And it took significantly longer. Because it required him to pull the engine out again using our truck. He tied our truck to the engine and pulled it out because we had to separate the engine from the transmission in the middle of the desert. Yep. <sighs> and so we replaced the part. My good friend, Nate, he comes and he helps me out. And like, shout out to him because he got absolutely trashed with me. So we were like, covered like head dirty. to toe. Yeah, like we're from dirt, rocks oil all the things and he's underneath the bus helping me we're getting this thing all married up and like get it all put back together he helps troubleshoot everything and we get on the road again and it's been amazing since and i feel like if that were to have happened before the engine blew i'd had nothing i'd had no idea but i had that confidence from replacing the engine and learning as much as i did from mm -hmm. john our mechanic and like being able to do that out in the desert it was just it was nice i felt a lot better Obviously, after it was done and the bus was up and running, but also knowing like, hey, if something happens, I have the knowledge or I have the connection to be able to make sure that we're going to be OK, that I can get this fixed, that we can keep moving and we can keep living our life. I, I just remember being a new RVer and something would happen and I would just be like, I'm I'm sorry, Sherry, the shower's leaking. We have to we have to sell the rig. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you learn, you learn as you go and you, and you get better at these things, but that's, a, that's a pretty detailed space that you're in to be able to do that sort of thing. But I imagine that that is critical for you to be able to know those sorts of things. If you're doing what you're doing full timing and, you know, break down in a place, it's 105 degrees and you've got to get going because the AC has got to keep running those sorts of things. You got to know what you're doing. You really uh -huh. do. Yes, yeah, for sure. So, um, I imagine that, you know, you've lived this way for about four years and on a bus, even though it's a very large bus, I think they're like 45 feet or something like that. Um, there's, uh, there's, it's not a lot, it's not a large space. It's got to be challenging. There's four people in a very small space. There's got to be challenges in family relationships in in marriage and things like that. What, what are some of the challenging things about being on the road like this? I can think of one specific time and I feel like maybe you're thinking of it too. Is <laughs> one morning he comes out of the bedroom and I'm sitting out here drinking my coffee and I am sobbing, crying. And I'm like, I just want to be able to, like, we were in the Pacific Northwest. It was pouring rain. It had rained for several days. So I'm sure that had something to do with it. And I was like, I just want to be able to do yoga in my bus, in my house. I just want enough space to be able to do yoga. I was like, this space is too small. It's not working. And then and then I just had a full on breakdown. I was like, I don't want to live in a bus anymore. I want a house. I want space to do yoga. And I just like in that moment, I was just devastated. I feel like by the fact that like, and like I felt like, I was so closed in and I was like, I, I'm done. Like, this has been great. And I, I'm done. She's ready for the next, for the next chapter. Yeah. And, um, that's what led to our remodel and so, where we're sitting right now. <laughs> I feel like there's, there's another part of like, like we're yin and yang here. So like, just as much as she's my anchor, I feel like at that moment, like I was hers. Yeah. I came out, she was sobbing. She was, she was like, I want all this space. She was like, I can't do it in our kitchen. We have this big old counter. And I just looked at her and I was like, well, let's get rid of it then. She was like, what? And I was like, yeah, like, if you don't like it, let it go. I was like, it's ours. We can do whatever we want with it. You want the space? I was like, 
it's got to go then. And that day, we removed we the counter. We spent out. that day remodeling and, and changing our bus. And we had this big, giant, like, shelf counter thing right where we're right sitting. Here. Yeah, and it took up most of our bus. And we had, like, hardly any space. And he's like, yeah, we'll just get rid of it. And so we did, and I fell in love with our bus all over again. And I was like, I have space now. I fe It feels so much more open. And it just made all the difference. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like, one, I'm a person that really likes change. I love remodeling. I love new environments and stuff. I mean, that's half the reason that we do this. And it just... It, it was exactly what I needed at that time, I feel like. Yeah, and so we we changed it up. Like, it took less than a day, and she was happy again. And it's really, I mean, like, that was a big thing for us. Like, if you don't like something, change it. Yes. Right? If you don't like your surroundings, change your surroundings. If you don't like, if you don't like the way your couch is, like, change it. Like, especially if you have the capacity to be able to do it. So, for me, I saw that as a very simple solution. Yeah. You don't like the counter here? It's too much in the way? It's got to go then. Yeah. Boom. And so then we just removed it out. Got all of her space back. She started doing yoga again, and everybody was happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's that you're you're talking about the the temporary nature of emotions. That taking the emotion and actually doing something about it, taking the action to change life for the better, and being resilient. Because many of the stories that you have both told here, it doesn't just talk about just a sense of resilience. It talks about a sense of being invincible. And this is something that you know I, I tend to talk about a lot. When you can transcend virtually anything that comes at you, the challenges become easier and easier as you go on because you recognize the, 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 the space that you um, that, you, that you have the competence, that you have the ability to overcome things. If we can do that, then we can most certainly do this. And that spirit just really emanates from the two of you. This this can-do spirit, this ability to transcend anything and just make it happen. It's as simple as removing something. It's as simple as adding something. It's as simple as um, troubleshooting a major issue that you're having and turning it into not a major issue. Yes, exactly yeah. that. Yeah, I feel like all the time I'm like, you can do this. You literally replaced our whole engine with zero knowledge of engines at all. I was like, this is nothing. Like, <laughs> yeah, she's a big confidence boost for me. So, like, she's like I said, we're a great yin and yang. We've been together mm -hmm. for we we did the we did the math. What's uh... yeah? Last night at the fire, we were all going around, and he got to us, and he said, and I was like, oh my gosh, like I hadn't realized. Sixteen years. Yeah. Sixteen years we'll have been together. Congratulations. So I feel yeah. Thank you. And I feel like a large part of that is that we essentially like grew up together. Like mm -hmm. we got together, I was 18, she was 19. And so then like our adult life, you just kind of, you learn the other person, you learn mm -hmm. the things that they're going to help calm them. They're going to help soothe them. They're going to like, they're going to rile them up. They're going to be their pet peeves. You kind of like learn all of those things and you understand how to interact with each other. And so like, we've been able to just kind of like help fix each other and build each other up in that manner, which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's 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 a long time of knowing each other, and then you really get to know each other in times of challenge. I mean, that that's when you really see what someone's made of. Yes. Yeah. And and so spirituality here, how do you enrich yourselves in a, a a way that keeps your spirit alive, in a way that makes you feel connected to the hereafter? How does that play out in your lives, and what what is your spiritual life like? So I'll let you talk to that. I'll let you talk to that. You're much better at that stuff. <laughs> well, I feel like I, I, I'm i trying to like understand your question. So hopefully my answer is sure. the right answer that you're asking. But basically, um, for example, like we have our home church back in Michigan and it's cool to watch it online. They live stream every Sunday and I really like it. One, because we really love our pastor and we love that church, but also because his parents go every Sunday and his dad is the guy that's like yelling, amen. And like, it's like, we're there with his family again, you know? And so it's just like a little piece of home. And it, it's just a really great way to like 
start your week. And when we're in Palm Springs, we have a church that we really like there. It's called the Garden Fellowship, and it has been really awesome. We went there around Christmas time. Our kids were in like the kids church there and Hadley almost sang in the Christmas program, but we all got sick right around Christmas. And yeah, so I'm really sad we missed that, but we actually intend to go back for Easter because we love that church so much. Yes. And so we like to find what we found is that on the road and like fellowship and having that interaction, there's a lot of people on the road that that will share a similar belief with you. Uh-huh. And so what we like to do is we'll get together with friends in the same area or understand where like certain people are going to church or like the kind of like the understanding or what the, what this is really doing for you. And then we'll just kind of go and check, check the church out for ourselves. We like to really... What really I feel like makes or breaks it is a a good pastor that's going to be able to translate the word and really into like good, relatable stories to it. And in the sense that like he can translate everything out to you, you can feel like you're together, you can feel like you're in a family. And I feel like that's what we look for in a church. That's what I look for in a a church. You can relate to your own life, too. Yeah. And as far as like our travels and like spirituality and our travels, I would like to elaborate on that a little bit more in the sense that I feel like there's, there's moments in our travels, like when the engine blew and stuff that just kind of validates everything. Like we are being watched over. I remember before we left, before we like launched on the road as full-time RVers, um, we at, we were at church and our pastor and his wife and his parents and us, we all huddled in a circle and they prayed over our travels and they prayed that God would watch over us in our travels. And I feel like ever since then he has, and I could list different ways that I'm like, yes, God was here. God protected us. Like, this has been like, like you can see it. And and I feel like I can see it more in our travels than I could back home. Yeah. And I feel like the way that that comes into play is like, yes, we had catastrophic things happen, like the engine blowing and the flex plate issues. And like, those are terrible things. And in the moment they seem very dark, but then when you, when you come out of it, you're like, this was, this was a very good learning experience. And then when you take a second and you even step back a little bit more, the, the odds and the statistics of how the things happened and when they did, it it's almost like a surefire way that there was a, there was divine interaction there mm-hmm. when the engine blew and we were coming down off of a 15 20 mile area that had nothing and the engine blew and we were able to just coast off into a spot where the entire family was going to be safe that's really hard to say i mean we traveled thousands and thousands of miles to end up having it happen at that exact moment for us to be able to be safe it's like something had to help uh, something had to be there to help and even when the flex plate broke when we put it into perspective we drove about 1200 miles on the new engine we replaced everything. We drove 1,200 miles to get down here. The engine was fine. I go and drive two more miles, mm-hmm. and the end, and then and then it breaks. <laughs> so when you look at when you look at the statistics of that, you're talking a 0.1 percent chance. There's 0.1 percent of our oval travel of when this happened, and the bus and everything was like, you know what, you're gonna be fine this whole way. We're gonna get you all the way down to where you need to go, and you're gonna be you're gonna be there. Something's gonna happen. I'm gonna trial you a little bit. I'm gonna push you a little bit. But you're in a safe place. You're in a place that you can take care of this, that you can learn and you can really grow from it. And so it's it's really hard to say. It's it's really hard to, to say that essentially that divine interaction did not happen for us. Yeah. It was for sure there. It was it definitely helped us. It helped us grow as a, a, together as a family, as a community. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've, I don't, I've loved it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a, this is wonderful. And thank you for being willing to talk about uh, spirituality in this, because it is such a neglected piece of life for so many people. And it's, you can, you can sense the spirit of positivity, the spirit of hope, the spirit of resilience in people that have a foundational faith belief that live through a set of values that are linked to others by that, that, that spirit. And so it's just wonderful to, uh, t- to learn about that from you. And when you are going about, I imagine that your celebrity, the the popularity that you have online, that do people recognize your rig and come up to you? 
Oh my gosh. I would not say celebrity by <laughs> any means whatsoever we feel, <laughs> at all. <laughs> we still feel pretty new to that whole thing, but it is, it is wild to be recognized. It's wild to go up and, and somebody be like, I know who you are. And it's like, yeah. That, like that's still something new. Yesterday, getting... our daughter was sitting at a table eating ice cream, and I was like making an epic mess. So I'm like doing the mom thing, right? I'm cleaning up all the ice cream, and this lady's like, "Hey, I know you. I I follow you. I watch all your videos." She recognized her from her voice. She was like, "It sounds like her," and then saw our face and was like, "It is her." And so, like that, that's a wild experience to have. Yeah. I, I imagine that it's going to get more and more as you, because because you're right up on a half a million followers, aren't you? On, on Facebook, we're just yeah. shy of half a million. And then yeah. on Instagram, I think we're at like 112, 113,000. TikTok, just under 100K. And our big push this year is we're really trying to grow our YouTube. So we've been on YouTube for almost 10 years. It's funny. She showed me a video earlier today of like how far we've come from vlogging. And so yeah, we were so awkward when we, we first were. started. We were. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's nice to see that change. And we started out on, on YouTube, not necessarily to like, to like vlog or be something on it, but it was like, it was like a home movie-esque. Yeah. So we recorded all the things. We recorded our kids growing up. We recorded yeah. our interactions of us developing as, as adults, as parents and things like that. So it's nice to look back and see how we were, the things that we had, like our values and things like yeah. that, and to see it slowly change. So for us, it's, it's, it's a lot like home movies. Yeah. So we just kind of keep transforming that and kind of keep communicating. I mean, I love to talk. She loves to talk. We love mm -hmm. to communicate with people. Like, it's just, it's been good times. And then within this past year and a half, two years or so, I would say that we really blew up, um, especially on Facebook. Facebook is a, is a, is our big platform like, where we're almost at a half million. And what I love from that is just all of the, the positivity, awesome the community that we've met, to yes, be honest. Exactly. Yeah. Because like that, that's awesome. Like I love talking to somebody. I love in some way, shape or form, if something that we had said or anything like that has, is positive to you has benefited your life like yeah. that's the goal the goal the is just to day be... yeah we just want to help people we just want people to live happy and live their most fulfilled lives and if we can help them in any way by saying hey you don't need the giant house or the fancy car or all that stuff it doesn't mean anything yeah yeah i mean stressing about those things it's not it's not doing you any good you know right no it, it's it's really not and I, I I saw a video of you recently where it looked like you were making fun of a negative comment that you received that said, it looks like they're just glorifying homelessness, which is a hilarious thing to say. And you were dressed in fancy clothes, just well, doing your regular thing. It was hilarious. And and so the, the humor that you have over just the basic thing are there hate monsters that just kind of make negative comments and, and drop a bomb and leave well i would say the funniest thing about that whole video is we didn't even have fancy clothes to wear for the video <laughs> we had to borrow them with from our friends which made it even funnier because his suit was, he huge. was like swimming in his suit <laughs> the friend that i I borrowed it from he's like he's like six three like he's a, he's a, he's a big guy and like i'm not i'm not that tall so like yeah. i wear it and it's just it encompasses my whole body and i was yeah. like it's just gonna add to it you know yeah what I mean? it's just gonna add to the because we like we like to share the happiness so even yeah. if, even if a negative comment comes our way in whatever sh way shape or form we try and transform that into some positive information back to them yeah because I feel like a lot of the times it's easy to say something mean on the internet and it's really easy to also take that to heart Right. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is just don't don't let it like eat you away. Keep your positivity, share your information, because sometimes people are just just don't really know what's happening. So we like, what we like to do is that if we get a negative comment or along those along those lines, we try and spin it back with some sort of positivity, something back in the sense that like, look, maybe like it's we're not a joke. Maybe maybe we make them laugh and that makes their day. And then they're not going to be mean to somebody else, you know? Yes, exactly. And so, like, even if we have to be that person that you want to, like, be mean to, like, we're going to take it. We're going to we're going to take it. We're going to keep walking. We're going to spend some positivity on it, you know, because at the end of the day, we just want everybody to be happy. Mm -hmm. There is an unlimited amount amount of happiness and positivity that's out there just spread that yeah what are your what what has been a time when there's been a safety concern 
that that you've been concerned about something there's been something that's made you feel uneasy what did you do where did you go what do you how do you deal with that okay i got that okay so one time we were driving through new mexico and i smelled what smelled like something burning and i said to alex i was like hey i smell something burning we should probably check that out and so he's like you know what we're low on diesel anyway let's stop and we'll check it out so he pulls up next to a diesel pump we're at a loves and he as soon as he hits the parking brake and turns off the bus he bolts out the door and he's running and if you know alex at all he is the most calm cool collected guy so when he starts running and looks panicked i need to panic <laughs> i that in my head i know something is wrong so i run out right behind him and i go up and i see that our battery compartment on our bus is smoking and he all he says to me is i'll be right back and he walks away to me I don't know anything about what's going on here. I see a diesel pump. I see smoke coming from our batteries. And I'm thinking our bus is going to catch on fire and it's going to blow up this whole gas station. And this diesel pump is going to explode. And so I, I have like seconds. This is going through my head. And I'm like, my kids are sleeping inside. It's like 2 a.m. So I run back in the bus and I wake up my son and I'm like, hey, we're going to go in the gas station. And because I'm not trying to panic them. And he was like, he sits right up out of a dead sleep and he goes, can we get snacks? And I'm like, yeah, for sure. Let's go get snacks. That's why I woke you up. We're going to go get snacks. And so I just grab Hadley. Um, I didn't even bother to wake her up. I just picked her up and brought her in. And so we go into the gas station and the kids are picking out their snacks. They're like, can we get toys? I'm like, yeah, you bet. I just like, I wanted it to be a fun, positive memory. I didn't want them to be scared. And so the kids are playing with their new toys in the aisle. We're still in this truck stop and Alex walks up and he goes, I moved the bus. I was like, what? You drove it. What are you doing? And he's like, yeah, it's fine. And so he he's like, we can go back out and figure out what's going on. So we pay for all the kids stuff. We go out there and he's explaining to me that the batteries are off gassing, that diesel is not like it won't explode. It's not, not going to blow up. Like, yeah, it's right, not just... combustible like gas is. And, um, and so this loves, this is another one of those like divine moments. Okay. This loves tanker, um, worker comes up and he looks at our bus and he goes, is that a MCI 102 DL3? The and, first time that has ever happened that somebody has named our rig to a T of yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. And wow. we were like, yeah. And he's like, what you got going on here? He's like, he's, he said his dad, he said his dad drove him for a living. He knows yeah. all about him. He knows everything that's going on with him. And so Alex says that the batteries were smoking and he's like, oh yeah, your alternator went. He was like, sometimes when they go, they tend to overcharge the batteries. And he's like, we actually have a 24 hours, a 24 hour loves care center right down the street. They'll take care of you. Just go right in there. And it was like. We were, it's something so catastrophic that I was so worried about our safety. All of a sudden, this guy comes who we don't even know, and he's just got the solution. He knows exactly what's wrong. And we get in the bus, and we go to this love center, and Alex goes in. He talks to them. They, they're they like, um, we can take care of you first thing in the morning. Why don't you guys go get some sleep out back? They let us sleep in the parking lot. And, yeah, it was just like... I, at one moment, I was so worried about our family safety. I thought our whole home was going to, like, blow up in a fiery explosion. And then we were sleeping soundly in, in a love's parking lot. And it, it's crazy how things work out. Yep. So that, that following morning, the guys come out, and I was like, all right, this is what we got going on. They have this alternator, and they're like, we can get it here in a couple of days. It's going to be, like, just shy of $2,000. And I was like, that's a lot. You yeah. Know? I was like, I was like, what, I was like, what are some things that we could do? And this guy kind of walks through some stuff about how the electronic components work for the bus and things like that. And we had solar installed on the rig already. And I was like, so I was like, I was like, let me ask you this. I was like, in theory, I was like, if I'm able to keep the bus batteries topped up and I essentially have like a trickle charge on them out all the this time and just remove mean <laughs> about him and his inventiveness and overcoming so many things. So I was like, I was like, we can just remove the alternate. I was like, I'll, ta I'll take the wire out because the alternator is the, the thing that's causing our problem. I was like, if I'm able to keep the batteries topped up, 
I was like, would I still in theory be able to drive? And he was like, yeah, he was like, he was like, you're going to do a lot of a large power draw when you start it, obviously for starting up the engine. He was like, and then you need the injector is going to need a little bit. And if you r- ride at night, so like all your lights, your headlights, your tail lights, your, your side lights, all those things are going to run. But he's like, other than that, he was like, there's not much of a power draw. And I was like, so I was like, I have a 24 volt, to 24 volt charger that I'm already u- utilizing on the bus to pull power from the alternator, to charge the house batteries. I was like, if I just switch this and I have that power coming from our solar going to the bus batteries, I essentially have our bus batteries always running on solar, always being topped up and managed that way. And we have been riding that way in the bus for the past year and a half. We do oh. not have an alternator. We run off of our solar like that. Yep. And for us, it was just like, that's one less component that we need. I don't need this big, massive alternator to charge anything because that's not what our, our requirement in the bus is. We don't do any of the things that the traditional bus going down the road would be. You don't. We don't have 60 people in here with some sort of power requirement where I need this big, massive alternator. I was like, at some point, if we ever need something, we have the ability to install it. But I mean, we're, we're running almost two years strong without one. So I'm comfortable enough to say that I don't need an alternator on the bus, <laughs> right? We've been we've been driving just fine, living our life just fine without it. Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh! Like like this, your your inventiveness of being able to fix these things, uh, you know, and and it's and you you learn as you go. I I do know that, but I mean this 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 stuff is is pretty involved. And and yeah. how do you? decide where you're going to go next like what is that mapping process how do you agree on it and are you ever at a disagreement in that so we pretty much go where the wind blows us um we'll go like if our friends are going to be in an area we'll try and link up and hang out with our friends so that's a big draw i feel like where there's events like currently we're at the courtside rv show with our friends and also just kind of where we haven't been and want to check out like we're looking to go to baja mexico soon and go chill on the beach because we've never been and yeah we're very relaxed we do not chart out our plans or have months of reservations or anything crazy like that we just drive yeah we get a we get a rough idea of something that we want to do and we're like all right we're going to try and shoot for this she's got this big old list of places that we want to see that we want to check out that she's uh, either seen like an instagram post about or something Mm -hmm. somebody doing something somewhere and we just kind of save all that stuff and then like if we're in an area be like all right what's around what's something that either we learned at a campfire that somebody said was fantastic because there's a hot spring or something nearby and we just kind of save all that stuff and we're very we're very go with the flow yeah very much like we our next place that we go, we have no idea. Like in these these next few weeks, we have an idea that we want to go to Baja and we want to do those things. But for the next couple of weeks, we have no idea where we're going to be. And so we're just going to wing it wherever feels comfortable, where we might have friends at, what what might be going on. And I feel like when we leave our life that open, we we open ourselves to a lot more fun and excitement and type of things that maybe we wouldn't be able to run into if we fully planned everything out. Not only that, but as soon as we plan anything at all something happens and it's all derailed so we've just given up <laughs> yeah we don't make long like like long future plans yeah like past six months we'll be like we'll try and do this yeah this this is a great idea but like not until it gets closer are we going to be able to full commit yeah i feel like when we full commit to something a year down the road six yeah. months down the road something happens from now until yeah. then that really puts a damper on it all so it's just like you know what we're very free-flowing spirits if we can get there, cool. If we can't, cool. We'll figure something out. We're going to keep this like happiness, make sure everybody's yeah. good. And then you're never disappointed, right? You're not like, oh man, I'm so sad. I missed out on all these reservations. You're like, I didn't have these reservations. I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Yep. Because I feel like then you just trade one stress for another. Yep. If you have all these plans, you're like, all right, I need to be here this month. I need to be here this month. I need to do this, this week of this month. It's like, now you're going to layer this level of stress and it might not be that much stress, but it is that layer that you're like, all right, I have to be able to take care of this and do this mm-hmm. and time this. And we feel like happiness comes a lot easier when it's a lot more kind of go with the flow. Very, very chill, very just enjoying your surroundings, enjoying your people, enjoying your community, enjoying your scenery, all of that. So I, I, I'm i just thinking while you're talking here about the way that your lives have gone and the life that you once lived, you're cutting hair, you're doing work on cars and everything like that. 
what is the difference in your overall sense of life satisfaction and happiness given that way that life was before versus this way of living? I think before our it, it was very much like are we in the right place of our lives that we should be? Like our friends are all buying houses and they have, you know, these nice jobs and they have like all these nice things and they have a pool and they have a playground for their kids. And it's like, you think about all those things and you're like, it's kind of like keeping up with the Joneses. You're like, am I where I should be in life? Am I doing the best that I possibly can? And now I feel like for me, I'm like, those things don't matter. I live in a bus. I I, I don't, it doesn't bother me if someone has a nicer house than me. What matters is, are my kids becoming good people? Is, is my life truly fulfilled? When, when it's the end of my life and I'm looking back on how I've spent and the person that I've become and the person that my kids have become, Am I going to say I like I should have worked more? I should have had a nicer house. I should have had a nicer car. No, I'm going to say I lived life to the absolute fullest that I absolutely could. I cherished every moment. I saw the best things in every day. And my kids are awesome people. And I I feel like that's when you truly have it all. Yes, for sure. I feel like when you start living life for you and you're not living life for somebody else. Yeah. Right. And so like that whole idea of like when we had our house and I was climbing corporate America and we were doing mm -hmm. all those things, we were doing that because like that was the idea. Like if, mm -hmm. if in order to make it, in order to be happy and do those things, like you need to follow these certain parameters. And what we found is that like that's not what made us happy. I feel like if we would have stuck stuck out with like the house and even at my even at my job before I got laid off, like I wasn't I was I wouldn't say that I was happy. I was doing the things we were we like on paper. If you look at our life from the outside, you're like, oh, these guys, these guys are happy. They have it figured out. Yeah. They've got their house in the country with acreage. They have a pool. They have two nice cars and all these things like you on the outside. You're looking in. You're like, wow, they really have it all. But no, we didn't have each other. There, there were so many times when we missed out on so much. He missed out on so much of our kids' lives when they were younger. And I, I think more than anything, we would give up all the things to have those memories back. Yes. Yeah. Because I feel like you don't that you only get those moments. You only yep. get those first ones. And then they're you, gone. Yeah. Your kids are only babies for so long. And then they grow up and then they move on. And for me, like, I've always wanted to be a parent. I knew as a kid, I was like, I was like, I'm going to want kids. I'm going to want to be able to like have that connection, have that communication, have, like foster, foster the growth and foster all those things. And so working all the time. And like, so at the one point when we were both working, like I was working, mm -hmm. she was working full time. Our kids were essentially being raised by a nanny. Yeah. And like, I'm not saying that, you know, that's not possible, but for us, that just, that wasn't making us happy. Yeah. Right? And then we didn't want our kids to be raised by somebody else. We wanted to raise our kids, but like mm -hmm. we had them, they're our children. There are, there are, there are many us, yeah. you know what I mean? And we want to be around them. We want to do all this interaction. And so like, that was, that was the big switch. That was like, I need to not, not focus on the work and the other things that are taking so much time away from my family, because I feel like if I was going to have a regret at the end of my life, if we mm -hmm. worked all the time, it was going to be, I wish I didn't work as much. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have spent more time with my family. And so like now the way we live our life is that we work enough to be able to sustain our life yeah. and do all of those things. And we focus being together. We focus yeah. being with friends and family and doing all those things. Cause again, we don't have to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. We don't need all these nice, fantastic things. We like the fact that like we have very minimal bills yeah. because Again, when that when the first of the month comes for rent or the, something comes up and it's time to make a payment, it's like, how am I going to make this? Or even if that thought process of uh, of like, do I put food on the table or do I pay this bill? Right. That's something that we just don't want to have in our life. That's a stress that we just don't want to ever have to worry about. And we've kind of designed that all around. So it's the reason why we have solar up top. There's a reason why the bus is is paid for. Like we we bought the bus with the, the proceeds of the house. So when we sold our house, because we we're like, this is us for sure. We're like, we're going to buy something outright. We don't want another payment. We don't want to have to worry about like, if I, if we can't afford this, that like something's going to get taken away. So for us, we know that like, it's not going to be that our house is going to go away at some point. If we can't do something like maybe we can't drive as far because diesel is a bit expensive, yeah. you know? And so we're like, all right, we're going to just keep our travel slightly minimal, but we're still going to have that togetherness. We're still going to have us. We're going to still have all of our things. We're going to still have the comfort of 
what we find in joy and happiness in life. And to be like completely and utterly honest, I feel like our goals and ambitions and everything have not changed at all. I, I do not aspire to be rich or have all the money or all the things in the world. I, I think true freedom and true happiness is having just enough to be able to live your life to where you're happy and you're not stressed. And I feel like any more than that, and this might be a bit of a hot take, but I feel like any more than that will just cause problems. I've seen some of the most unhappy people out there have the most money. And I feel like, you know, mo money, mo problems. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, to be honest, I want to live minimally. I want to live in my bus. I want to have my family. I want to have some adventures. And that's all. Yeah, that's us. What is the future for your family? Where are you going from here? Yeah. <laughs> well, gosh, we don't even plan our travels. The future, bro. <laughs> I, I would say one thing that we really want to do is we want to do more travel. So like yeah. we drive around and we see all the states and we do all that stuff and it's awesome. But the world is huge, mm -hmm. right? And the cultures that are around the world and the other like the people and things like that, I really like immersing myself and our family in other people's environments and other people's yeah. culture and like kind yeah. of seeing what's going on. So that's one reason that I'm really excited to go down to Baja is yeah. I want to go down there and I, I just want to like immerse ourselves in that same stuff, eat the same foods, live the life that somebody, if they were in that area their whole life that they would live because we're very open as far as like how people live and how people do certain things. And I feel like that would be a lot of fun to traverse overseas to. Yeah. And our son really, really wants to go to Africa. He he loves like all the he big wants cats. Wants to go on an African safari. Yes. So we 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 yes. did tell him like, and I, I, it, we're coming up a lot closer to it now. I was like, when we get to a million on Facebook, oh gosh, we'll we do, did make that promise. We'll, we'll do we'll do an African safari. And at the time when I said that, <laughs> we were we like, had, we'll never actually hit yeah. it, so we can say that we were in like the twenty thousand, thirty thousand. We were gaining, and I was like, it's gonna be a waste. You know yeah. what I mean? And like, oh then slowly gosh. it starts coming up more and more. But I mean, like, we're gonna hold true to our word. Yeah, that happens. We're gonna have to go and do an African safari because it's something. It it brings me joy to know that our kids also want to travel and experience mm -hmm. more things and be around others and really experience other cultures. So I feel like that's what our next travel is. Our next our our next step is just more I, international, exactly. more cultures. Like yeah, yes. How do people get in? How do people find you? Um, we have our website, which is www.wearethewanderlusters.com. And that links to all of our social media. But on Instagram, we're we are the wanderlusters. We are the wanderlusters on TikTok and Facebook and YouTube. Luckily enough, I've done it one time. You can just type the wanderlusters in Google and it'll pull all of our stuff up. And I was <laughs> like, I was like, okay, I was like, if we can just type that and we come up, I was like, I feel like we we're on the market. We're on the books. Like people know oh who we gosh. are. You know, that's exactly how I was able to get in touch with you. I was all of your stuff on Google is so well organized and it's, it's, it's right on there. You type in the wanderlusters or we are the wanderlusters and it's all right there. So your SEO is really, really good. So oh, good. I, like it. Yeah. So I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so just, I want to tell you how wonderfully enriching it has been to have a conversation with you because the wonderful thing about the two of you is just the unbridled joy and possibility and optimism and can do spirit that the two of you have just as a piece of your overall kind of aura, if you will, the two of you have this, this wonderful sense of possibility that, that is so ingrained in, in, in your spirits. And you, you have this, this real true thoughtfulness and mindfulness. There's never a, a pause in just going, no, this is what we are about. This is what we are about. So what I, I just hope for you and your family is blessings for health and for wonderful adventure adventures and 
for wisdom and the uh, ability to make wonderful decisions that are going to lead to great things for you. And I, I know that that's going to continue to be something that that you you exercise, that your children are going to be so fabulously enriched by the, the way that you've cho chosen to live a life that is against the grain and you have you have broken the shackles of being these kind of um um just getting by to the next month kind of people that so many people are locked into and and it feels like a prison and and the the, the two of you have taken your children on this wonderful journey that is going to be something that are, is talked about generations from now in your family for for the the courage that it took for the two of you to make this decision and and continue to live in this way. So I just I've enjoyed this conversation so much because of your bravery, your fearlessness and your just your openness and everything. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. We've enjoyed this too. It's been yes. great talking to you. Yes. <laughs> and to everybody else out there uh, thank you so much for watching this podcast episode and, and make sure to like and subscribe to the Mindful Mutiny podcast. We'll be sharing this far and wide. And if anything that you do, you make these decisions, you stick with them, and just in all of the things that you do, go be something great. Everybody has greatness in them. Let it shine. Absolutely. <laughs>